well, thank you. It is uh, great to be with all of you today. Luke, thanks for introducing me and also just inviting me here uh, to be with all of you. Uh, to those of you, I've heard there are people streaming right now. Um, that's what I look like, but I can't give a talk for 45 minutes with myself behind me the whole time. So uh, apparently when this goes up on YouTube, they'll integrate it and people there can watch me and not just the slides, but if you're streaming, you're just gonna get the slides and my voice uh, from here on out. So, um, so I'm a social neuroscientist. I have been looking at people's brains, mostly using uh, MRI scanners for about 20 years now, a little longer than 20 years. Uh, and at some point around 10, 12 years ago, I started getting introduced, uh, invited to come speak to different sort of business related groups. And actually a bunch of the talks were uh, at Oracle early on and other leadership organizations. Uh, and so it got me thinking about, you know, what on earth uh, does my work have to say that's relevant to business, to thinking about uh, how the social brain is sort of doing its thing at work. And so part of what I think about um, is sort of how do we kind of promote well-being, productivity, happiness, all these things that you sort of want to see more of at work. And to do this, you basically need uh, a good model, a good theory of what sort of motivates and drives human beings. Uh, and so I think that the sort of inherited wisdom we've had for hundreds of years, you can't really do much better than Thomas Hobbes, who summed it up in a single sentence. Uh, man has no other end in all his actions than his private self-interest. Um, so we get as much good stuff as we can for as little work, as little pain as possible. Um, and if you want to see evidence of this, um, one easy way to sort of see this is to go to uh, a game that uh, economists developed, I think back in the late 80s, maybe it was the early 90s. Uh, no, it was earlier. It was the 80s called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And I'm sure some of you are uh, familiar with The Prisoner's Dilemma. I won't describe all the, the details of it. The key things you need to know is that typically two people are playing uh, with or against each other. Uh, they never meet each other and they are never going to meet each other. They typically play one round of the game. So there's no concern with reputation. Uh, and the key thing about the way you play the game is that your outcomes are interdependent. So the way you play affects both your outcomes and the other person's, and the same is true for them as well. And so there's two ways you can play the game. You can play the game uh, selfishly, where you try to maximize the amount of money you'll take for yourself, and it is definitively going to come at the expense of less money for the other person. And the other option is to play in a sort of more communal sort of way where you try to maximize the amount of money that you and the other person are going to earn jointly, but that will definitely come at the expense of you getting less money personally. These are the two options. Um, and in line with economist predictions, the vast majority of people play this game selfishly. They go and say, uh, I'll take the most money for myself. Thank you very much. And so games like this, uh, give rise to the view of uh, human nature as being something like uh, homo economicus, something like that, where we're basically rationally self-interested creatures, where we're fundamentally selfish, uh, we try not to exert too much effort, we can be reasonably rational in some contexts, and we pursue wealth and other sort of material gains for ourselves. Uh, and that's what's been shown in hundreds and hundreds of iterations of this game, uh, The Prisoner's Dilemma, but there's a version of this game that you are probably not familiar with uh, that I think is sort of an interesting contrast. So actually it's the exact same game. So in this version of the game, you have the exact same rules described to you word for word the same. And you play the game exactly the same way. But at the start of the game, when they're introducing the rules, instead of uh, describing the, or uh, defining the game one way or another, in this particular version of the game, they say, Today you're gonna to be playing the community game. And then they explain the exact same rules as what is normally taking place in The Prisoner's Dilemma. And when you do this, the percentage of people who play selfishly drops precipitously, and suddenly now almost everybody, well, three quarters of people, um, suddenly now play communal, communally and try to sort of do what's best for the group. And so in addition to suggesting that uh, human beings are 
exquisitely sensitive to context and situational pressures and so on. What it also may suggest um, is that we are sort of more than just homo economicus, we are also homo socialis. Um, that we may have these sort of intrinsic uh, social concerns and that what we're looking for is when we're supposed to demonstrate these motives and when we're supposed to demonstrate those motives. Okay, and that we have both of these and we use both. I'm not trying to suggest we're not selfish creatures, uh, we are. But we are not only selfish creatures is part of what I'll argue. So for the time I have with you, I'm going to try to do three things. Um, the first thing I'm going to try to do is present to you some of the neuroscience data that we've collected in an attempt to sort of prove to you that our ability and our skills at being social is not just another program we learn like how to play chess or algebra. Those are things that we can learn because we have this great prefrontal cortex that's super flexible and can learn any new sort of rule-based kind of thing if it's useful for us to learn it. Um, but instead, what I'm going to suggest is, is that our social operating system is part of the basic components of, of who we are as mammals, that all mammals actually share this, uh, and we have plenty of it as well. Uh, if I convince you of that, hopefully I will, I'll spend some time then trying to tell you some things about uh, why uh, paying more attention to our social nature is really important for thinking about uh, happiness, well-being, and productivity in the workplace. And then, uh, I assume I will have time because I set a timer for myself to make sure I get to this last piece because that's the piece I'm actually most excited about. Uh, that's about sort of where our work is going and where it's now really directly relevant to thinking about neuroscience and social neuroscience specifically in the workplace and how we can sort of use it there uh, in a way that it, I think, really hasn't been used in the past. But let's start at the beginning, trying to convince you that some of these social aspects of ourself um, are really, really sort of a basic part of who we are. So um, let's start with the concept social pain. Uh, so we came up with the concept of social pain back in the early 2000s, and because we came up with it, we got to define it. And so our definition, there's various ones we've used, but it's the pain associated with actual or potential threats to one's social connections. And if we want to be sort of extra wordy, it can be actual threats, actual or potential threats to one's actual or potential or imagined social connections. So it's, it's sort of a pretty flexible concept. But when most people see this definition, uh, what you're likely to think is, oh, I get it, so people are bothered when they're socially rejected, so you're using social pain. But that's just a metaphor. Social pain is metaphorical language, it's poetic license. And so what I want to take a few minutes to do is to think about what it would take to persuade you that social pain is every bit as much of a real kind of pain as uh, when you stub your toe or when you have a headache. That from the brain's perspective and from an evolutionary perspective, social pain is very much a real kind of pain. It just manifests in a slightly different way, but all physical pains manifest in different ways. So, um, you know, the first thing that's worth noting is that while this may be a metaphor uh, for social pain, and in English we use language like, you hurt my feelings and she broke my heart. So we use the language of physical pain to talk about social pain. And it turns out it's not just in English. Uh, there was a paper published years ago, not by my group, uh, showing that in languages all around the world, including lots of non-romance languages, the language of um, social pain is based in the language of physical pain. At least I assume it is. I, I, every once in a while now when I get up here I realize I can't translate most of these, but I assume the authors who wrote this paper could, and uh, someone would have made them retract the paper by this point if they were uh, inaccurate in their translations. Uh, so we are neuroimaging folks, we're neuroscientists, and so our approach is not to look at how the language is common around the world, although I think that's super interesting, uh, but instead we tend to put people in these giant coffin-like donuts um, where you hear really loud noises. It's not a terribly pleasant place to be, unless you're me, I tend to fall asleep in scanners when people put me in. Um, it's a little bit like being in the womb, or it's terrible. It's one or the other for most people. And we bring folks in, and this was back in 2001, 2002, we brought folks in, and we had them play this silly little ball tossing game called Cyberball. And in Cyberball, 
uh, you're controlling this hand at the bottom. If you're the subject in our scanner, you're controlling this hand, and you believe you're playing with two other real people over the internet who are also laying in scanners right now. Um, of course, we are social psychologists, so we lie to people all the time about what they're doing in the studies, and after a few minutes, the game changes. And some of you may now start to be able to realize how the game changes. Uh, the other two people who are really just uh, code, they're not uh, people at all, uh, they stop throwing the ball to the real subject. And this goes on for a few minutes. Subjects get out of the scanner and they're usually either kind of depressed or angry, but they definitely tend to have a, a significant emotional response to this. And so what we were interested in is what was happening in the brain while people were being rejected or uh, excluded from the game compared to the earlier period when they had been included. These are the brain regions associated with the distress of physical pain. Okay, so the more bothered you are by any painful experience that you have, the more activity you're going to see in these two regions. And when we looked in the brain at what was different between the people's responses when they were being uh, excluded compared to when they were included, these were the only two regions of the brain that were more active during rejection than when folks were included. Moreover, when people got out of the scanner, we asked them to tell us how painful it was to be rejected while they were playing this very boring game. And the more they told us they felt that it was a painful experience, the more these two regions showed increasing responses. And so this persuades um, a fair number of people that um, social pain is a real kind of pain. But if it doesn't persuade you, um, perhaps the follow-up study will. It turns out that if you give people Tylenol, all these effects go away. Okay, so the same painkiller that you take for your headaches actually works in some sense for your heartaches, for your sense of being rejected or excluded. It works for that as well. Uh, important caveat here, do not try this at home. Tylenol is super toxic. 500 people a year die from Tylenol overdoses. Um, and so while there are clinical trials going on and we did this, this was done in a very sort of proper, appropriate lab-based way, don't do this at home, okay? Um, there, I told you not to. If you do, that's on you now. All right. Um, so, you know, we, we have this, I think, very basic inborn sensitivity to uh, social rejection that manifests itself in the form of pain. And it turns out it's not just humans. Um, all mammals show this kind of response, and they tend to show it in the same regions of the brain. So you can look at rats, you can look at monkeys, there are other animals that have been looked at as well, and they tend to show this same response. We have it because for humans who are born incapable of taking care of themselves when they're infants, you need a way to stay connected. And this makes the infant and the caregiver feel connected and are very sensitive to distress in the other, especially the caregiver is very sensitive to the social pain distress calls given by the infants of pretty much any mammals. And so the upshot of this is that social pain is one of the things that motivates us to stay connected, to stay together. And that allows us to do all sorts of extraordinary things like build buildings with air conditioning and roofs and things like that, that pretty much if you were on your own and weren't feeling any motivation to connect with other people, we might never have developed these sorts of things. Now on the flip side of social pain, we have social pleasures, which are nicer to think about and talk about and so on. Uh, and it turns out that the same pretty primitive brain system that we share with reptiles and most other animals that can walk, um, the ventral striatum, the region shown in fire here, um, this is a region that we've known for years and years responds when people in the scanner uh, win money, uh, when they get to eat something that's delicious, when they look at pictures of pretty people, right? All those things activate this system. But it also turns out, we've known for a few years now, that being liked, loved, respected, or even just feeling understood are all things that activate this same system. Okay? Uh, so this is a system that seems to be just as sensitive, some evidence suggests it's more sensitive to social rewards than these other kinds of rewards that we sort of tend to think of when we think of rewards in general. All right, it's better to give than to receive. You've all heard this presumably at some point. Usually it's associated with someone getting a pretty bad gift uh, around Christmas or Hanukkah. Um, does anyone know who first said it's better to give than to receive? I'll tell you, your brain. 
Your brain first said this, because all humans are built with this wired in. Remember, we started with the prisoner's dilemma, uh, where you can decide to play selfishly or for the group. And if you have any strong views that you know we are rationally self-interest, going for the money kinds of creatures, you might imagine that there'd be social norms suggesting that there are times when we think we're supposed to give money to the group, to work communally. You could say that community condition was just people being sensitive to norms and being afraid of what the experimenter would think. But if that's the case, you would still expect that the brain's reward system to respond most strongly when people chose to play the game in the way that would, by definition, maximize their own earnings. But that is not what happens in the prisoner's dilemma. In the prisoner's dilemma, you get the most activity in the ventral striatum when you play communally. Okay, so this is a case, this is a different kind of social reward. The first kind I told you about is when people tell you they like, love, respect you. This kind of social reward is when you do for others. And it turns out that we're built such that doing for others is also a rewarding, pleasurable experience. One that we don't always have a very good theory of, but it definitely is true. Uh, Adam Grant, who's at uh, the Wharton School in Pennsylvania, UPenn, um, he wrote a wonderful book on the benefits of sort of being a giver at work instead of um, a taker. If, uh, if you are gonna buy one book this year, well, buy mine. Uh, but if you're gonna buy two, I, I would highly, highly recommend uh, his book. Uh, and one of the things he found in this book is that if you go take folks who are doing relatively menial, thankless work, like working a phone bank, trying to raise money for scholarships for the university, where everybody is hanging up and trying to get off the phone with you, and you bring someone in who won one of their scholarships that they're raising money for, who then tells some of these phone bank folks about how the work they're doing actually tangibly benefits someone, the, the productivity of these folks goes through the roof. And when I say it goes through the roof, I don't mean that day or the next day where you would expect them to be like, oh, that was so great, that was fun, that we heard from that 20-year-old telling us what this award meant for them. It's a month later that they come back and measure. And a month later, the productivity of the folks who got this intervention is dramatically higher. And this has been replicated several times in different contexts. So I think it's really legit. So humans are sensitive to social pain, social pleasure. You would think that if these are things that can really move around our well-being, we might have a system in our brain that helps us navigate the social world so that we can maximize our social pleasures and minimize the social pains. Uh, for some time, people thought that it was the sort of basic analytical system in the brain, which is shown here in green, um, loosely shown here in green. These are systems that are involved in math and logical reasoning and accounting and working memory, holding things temporarily in mind. Uh, but it turns out that there really is a completely separate network that's involved in our social thinking that doesn't really overlap with the network for analytical thinking at all. And we've learned some interesting things about this network. One of the things we've learned is that these two networks, the social thinking and analytical thinking networks, kind of operate like a neural seesaw, where activity in one going up tends to be associated with activity in the other going down, and vice versa. They seem to trade off of each other. And we can think immediately about how that might be relevant in the workplace, right? I mean, um, I assume Google, like most companies, really prioritizes people being highly analytically skilled many, many hours of the day. Uh, and the goal is to just sort of emphasize that without necessarily detracting from other sort of capacities that we might have. But there's some evidence to suggest that if you're putting the pedal to the metal on the analytical side, that may come at a real cost of actually dampening down uh, some of our uh, social skills and our ability to detect certain things socially in others in our social environment. Um, another thing we've learned is sort of a, a funny result, and, uh, and I'll show it to you this way. So let's say I brought you into my scanner. It's not my scanner, it's UCLA's scanner. I brought you in and uh, I told you that what you're gonna do is lay in the scanner, you're gonna do math for a minute, and then you're gonna lay there and rest and do nothing for a minute, and then math for a minute and rest. And the math is super easy, it's like three plus four type math. And the rest is nothing. And this time, even though I'm a social psychologist, I'm not lying to you. This is exactly what you do while you're laying in the scanner. And so we can go look at these analytical parts of the brain 
and they will do just what we would expect them to do. They'll do something like this. This is idealized, but something like this. When you're doing math, the analytical parts light up, and when you're resting, they quiet down because you don't need them to rest and do nothing while you're laying in the scanner. Now we can look at the same exact task and what's happening in the social brain, in the social thinking network. Well, what we would expect to see is this, not much at all, right? Because you don't need your social brain to do math. In fact, if you activate your social brain while you're doing math, it interferes. And you don't need your social brain during rest, right? So that's what we'd expect to see, but what you actually see is this. Okay. So uh, the social brain comes on incredibly reliably any time there's a break in the action. And it comes on within a few hundred milliseconds of finishing any sort of cognitive goal-directed task. So there are folks who have done things with depth electrodes. They put them right in the right positions, and they can tell within 300 milliseconds, it's actually a guy at Stanford nearby, um, that within 300 milliseconds, the social brain pops back on Okay, whenever there's a break in the action. And so we can ask ourselves, well, why would that happen? And while I'm not going to um, spend lots of time in my, la uh, sorry, in my lecture today going over why that happens, um, what I can tell you is that the summary result from our studies is that to the extent that you spontaneously activate this network in short periods of downtime, in between sort of more significant events in your life, if the next thing you have to do involves social thinking, you're better prepared for it. Okay? You actually perform better on social tasks where you have to think about what's going on in the minds of other folks to the extent that this network has spontaneously activated itself. And what that suggests is that evolution has essentially made a bet that the best thing to do with our spare uh, cycles in our brain as we have downtime is to get ready for thinking socially, that that is really evolutionarily significant because this is pretty much the only thing in the brain that has this sort of pattern, where every time there's a break and we can reset, it resets towards the social domain. We actually have a lot of data that speaks to that now. Um, and so in essence, what that does for us, and I think this is really, really important, is that when we look out into the world, we could see all of this just as physical objects in, you know, in physical motion, right? We could describe it all in terms of physics and mechanics and so on. But most people, the vast majority of people, when they look at this, what they see is psychological meaning. They see people having thoughts, feelings, interactions, intentions, um, and this tendency to turn on this network as we walk into each new experience is something that sort of prepares us to see the world in a psychological fashion rather than in sort of a physics-based mechanical fashion. Um, so that's a very sort of short course on sort of some of the evidence to suggest that we really do have some basic uh, social features to us and that we are not purely self-interested. We are not just uh, homo economicus. We are that, but not just that. Um, of course, I could have skipped those 20 minutes and just showed you uh, the quote from Albert Einstein where he says, man owes his strength in the struggle for existence to the fact that he is a social animal. Um, but, you know, then I would have no job being here at all. I could have just showed you that slide. So I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you now about how some of these things relate to uh, business directly. And then I'm gonna turn to what we're doing now uh, with a different kind of neuroscience that's more work relevant. And I'm pretty excited to get to that. Okay, so uh, in any workplace, in any business, you're uh, off trying to hire folks. And it's been a long time now that we've understood that the goal of hiring folks is to accrue the most talent, right? So any HR department is out there trying to sort of find the individuals uh, who are A-plus people. And the A-plus people are the people with the highest IQs, the most training and experience, who went to the best schools, and norms about these things change over time. But that's roughly speaking describing what's happened over the last you know, couple of decades in terms of how we try to acquire people. And the goal is to make sure then that your company has the most human capital. Um, so it's almost like a, a sort of role-playing game where you're trying to get people with the most sort of intellectual and academic skills for performing the feats they will need to do at work. Some economists looked at this and discovered that if you want to see the relationship between human capital and the company's bottom line, the vast majority of that relationship is actually explained by the links between the individuals 
in the company. Um, and so here, what we're talking about is not human capital, but social capital. The extent to which a company makes the boundaries between people and sections of the company permeable so that they can connect easily with each other. And what's critical about this is, you know, you've got this A plus person down here with some special set of skills, and if they're siloed and they don't feel really connected to other folks, well, that person up there is never gonna benefit from their skills when they could, and vice versa. This person is not going to easily seek them out because they don't have an easy path to get access to them. So it's important to build this kind of social capital purely for economic reasons uh, at companies. Here's another version of, of something similar. So uh, this is sort of a phone bank company, I think in Germany, and the company Humanize, who does sort of the badge testing where it tracks you know, your every movement throughout the day, they did a study uh, with this company and the way the company was working when they showed up is that there'd be five or six people in a phone bank that were in a pod together, and they would get their 15-minute breaks staggered so that they all took their breaks at different times. And Humanize came in and said, hey, why don't you give them their breaks together? Because if you give them their breaks together, they'll actually be more socially connected to one another and actually feel like they're on a team. Now, this seems like a really small difference, okay? But it turned out that this difference had really significant effects on the extent to which people at the company felt cohesive with the other people they worked with, the productivity they had, the stress levels they had. So these simple changes where they're being sensitive to enhancing the social dynamics of the group had really substantial effects. And they've done other studies like this as well and, and tend to see something. If nobody is focusing on the social aspects, of a company, that becomes low-hanging fruit because nobody's actually gone after the low-hanging fruit before, and this is, I think, that sort of thing. Uh, we can think about performance feedback, right? Everybody gets performance feedback at most companies. There's a few companies that have done away with it. It's hard to do away with it. You want your employees to get feedback, but nobody likes getting performance feedback. Uh, and so for me, one of the things I always think about when I think about performance feedback is that for the person giving the feedback, they're just giving constructive advice for how you can go be more efficient and effective. And for the person receiving the feedback, it's like somebody's punching you in the face, typically, unless you're you know, the golden child of, of whatever company you're working at. And so we have a way of understanding that, right? So we've talked about social pain, and the idea is, is that if we think of this as a genuinely painful event for people, to be told information that may make you feel less valued and worthy at the company that you're working at, then it's weird to think that those folks should be able to just go back to work and be effective. We wouldn't expect someone to break their leg and then go back to work. We'd say, go take that, get that taken care of and come back to work when you know, it's all you know, in a cast and, and feeling better. There's work that shows that after people have been rejected, okay, um, their IQs go down significantly, and their performance on standardized tests like the GREs plummet, right? 68% right if you've just been accepted and made to feel good, 39% if you've just been rejected, okay? So after you've just been rejected, don't go take the GREs. You will not do well, okay? It's not a good solution. Eat some ice cream. Um, we can think more directly about uh, happiness and sort of how to promote that. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, two of the major factors that drive happiness are uh, money and health. Uh, so let's start with health. Uh, so we all know smoking's bad for you, right? In California, almost nobody ever smokes anymore. But like in most of the world, lots of people still smoke. Um, you can look at the uh, morbidity statistics uh, for your likelihood of essentially dying from different kinds of behaviors. Um, from like not being physically active, being obese, having pneumonia, and smoking's like the worst one from uh, behaviors that you can personally engage in. Okay, smoking's really, really bad, and that's one of the reasons we spend about a half billion dollars a year in the United States to stop people from smoking and to get people to stop smoking once they have started. But what I haven't shown you here, which is the most interesting part of the chart, is that it actually turns out that not cultivating um, a meaningful social group is actually more dangerous to your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, so um, while health is super important for your well-being, turns out that being socially connected is also super important for your well-being. Um, 
We know people value being wealthy. We know people value material wealth. The percentage of people who value it has gone up and up in the United States. Um, and I value it too, so I'm not really sort of throwing stones at all. But what I will say is, is that this seems largely to be a mistake because as wealth rises, happiness typically doesn't change at all. And you can cut the data a million different ways. Unless you're moving people from genuine poverty to out of poverty, then every dollar really does change happiness and well-being. But once you hit a certain threshold, you get very diminishing returns for increasing money. So what makes people happier? Well, the people who report being very happy are the people who spend lots of time with friends and family. Uh, some economists looked at this uh, using uh, money as a sort of comparison point, and they said, okay, how much does spending an extra hour a week with someone you really like, going to get coffee with them or something like that, how much does that increase your happiness? And they put it in terms of money. They said, how much money would you have to make extra in a given year in order to get the same amount of happiness you get from spending an hour uh, a week with a good friend, okay? Turns out, it's a giant amount of money. You have to make an extra $100,000 a year to get the same increase in your happiness as spending an hour with someone you like. You get to pick the person you're talking about here, someone you like. Which of these is more fun? Working to make an extra 100 grand or spending time with a friend? And as we do this, we have less time to do this. Right? These are the choices we all make. We move cross country for job opportunities and leave our social networks behind. Um, we can think about this within the workplace specifically, not just having friends in life, but having friends at work. It turns out uh, that while people who love the company they work at often say it's because they love the interesting and challenging work they do there, uh, they also often say their number one reason for loving the company they work at is the coworkers that they get to work with. And people who say, I have a best friend at work, um, people who answer yes to this, the divisions of companies they work in, okay, tend to have customers who are happier, they're more productive, and uh, they show greater profit. Um, so, the upshot of this, and then I'm gonna turn to my last piece, is that in the workplace, we tend to think that this is the primary way to incentivize people. Um, when you look at all the incentive structures, they almost always either come down to current or future promised money in one form or another. Um, health plans are just money that are being spent for you in a certain other material way. Uh, and the point is that we have some needs that money are really, really good at covering. So if you go to Maslow's hierarchy, and this is a simplified form with physical, social, and meaning needs, uh, physical needs are pretty well handled with money, but the other two aren't at all. And so again, these become low-hanging fruit. If nobody is incentivizing anyone with these other approaches, then they become a really effective way for you to sort of make that kind of difference in whatever group you're working in. Okay, so last chunk of what I'm gonna talk about is um, what I think one of the big parts of the future of social neuroscience is, and it's gonna have a big uh, connection to the workplace and not just be in you know, the ivory tower where um, I tend to work. Um, this kind of work involves getting away from giant heavy uh, MRI scanners and getting to lightweight, portable, mobile neuroimaging technologies like functional near-infrared uh, spectroscopy, or FNIRs. Uh, MRIs depend on differences in the magnetic properties of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. FNIRs is kind of the same, except it depends on the light absorption properties that differ between those two types of blood. Uh, it's basically just the same thing as the pulse oximeter you wear on your finger when you go to the doctors, uh, except it's all over your brain. And it's super po uh, portable and mobile, uh, so you can sort of put you're basically putting a very small computer and a sizable battery in a backpack, which you can either wear or put on the table behind the subject. It doesn't have to actually be on your back, but it allows you to be flexible in where you do your research and the kind of research that you can now do that you could never do with an MRI scanner. And it has downsides as well. There's no question it doesn't have the same spatial resolution as MRI, and currently it doesn't penetrate very deep into the brain, so it gets you the cortical surface but I think in the next five to seven years, that's probably going to change a fair bit as well.
So the first thing we did when we decided to test out this equipment was we wanted to go replicate something we had done in our lab over and over again. So there's this paradigm that Emily Falk, uh, one of my former graduate students and I developed, where we try to persuade people while they're laying in the scanner, and then we uh, ask them later and, and track them in various ways using wrist trackers and other things uh, to see how much they've actually changed their behavior in line with whatever we were trying to persuade them of, to use sunscreen more, to stop smoking, to get more physical exercise, to sleep more. We do lots of uh, public health types of things like that. And it turns out that when you see activity in this medial prefrontal region here that's shown in yellow there, when that goes up, when people are seeing the messages, people tend to then change their behavior in message consistent ways. We think this has something to do with basically adopting and integrating the message into your identity because this is a region that's very much associated with self processes and valuation. So we think, but we don't know for sure, that that seems to be part of what's going on there. Uh, on the flip side, when people are resistant to a persuasive message and they're internally counter-arguing, saying this is stupid because, you see more activity in the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and you'll see less behavior change over time. So we did the same thing in our first uh, study with FNIRS and we basically found the exact same result. We were actually pretty shocked that we found this. We thought maybe we'd get a little bit of something, but there it is. So um, this is showing, to us at least, that we can do something analogous with FNIRs that we could be, you know, that we've been doing for years and years with fMRI and we had a lot of confidence in. But FNIRs has the ability to do so much more than just replicate what we've been able to do while people are laying on their back in the scanner. And this often involves um, uh, an approach called neural synchrony. Uh, there's other names for it as well, but I call it neural synchrony. And the basic idea is you go to the same spot in two different people's brains as they're experiencing something, and you look at how the activity there fluctuates over time. And to the extent that two people in the same spot in their brains are watching a video or having a conversation, and their fluctuations are fluctuating together, that's neural synchrony. And if they're doing random different things, there is no synchrony in that case. And it turns out, and I'll show you data to back this up in a minute, that what this really tends to get at is whether two people aren't literally just being exposed to the same thing, but are sharing the same experience of it. They're experiencing it and having the same kind of understanding and perspective on what's going on. But first I wanna show you what neural synchrony uh, looks like. Uh, so these uh, are the results of two people uh, these are their brains, uh, watching a fighter pilot video. They didn't watch it together, they're just time locked to be shown together. And um, let's see, to orient you, the more sort of red and orange you can see on the color bar over there, the more activity that's occurring in that part of the brain, and the more uh, sort of green and blue, the less activity. And so I think you'll be able to hear the sound. We'll just watch this, it's a 20 second video, but hopefully you can see the synchrony occurring with your own eyes. Positioning for the overbank. Waiting for the lead. There goes the lead and overbanking 5G over the top. Throttles back as we descend back into low level. Okay, so hopefully you could sort of see it. If not, this is sort of each of the two brains at different points in time. And you can see that the brains are more like each other than they are their own brain at other points in time. Now here's the same video shown again, this time without sound, but this time, this person on the right is internally doing math. So their eyes are on the video. If you're looking at them, you can't tell that they're experiencing it any differently than this person. But as soon as you see their brains, it's obvious. They are not experiencing the same thing right now. They are not responding at all the same way to what they're taking in. And so this is really, really cool, at least I think it's really cool, that we can tell this without asking people, how distracted were you? Imagine at a, you know, a conference room meeting and you're gonna ask everyone, so how distracted were you during the meeting? Nobody's gonna say I was distracted, right? They're all gonna say, oh, I was totally present and man, I'm having great ideas after that meeting. Um, but we all know that we've been that person and there's other people who are being that person right now. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about right now because you're being that person right now and that's fine. I have no problem with that because if I was in the audience, I might be that person. 
Um, but I think that's a really interesting thing to be able to detect that, I think, in a pretty robust way. So, um, so let me tell you about something that, that we've done with this where we can show it's really about people sharing perspective. Um, uh, so we take the equipment, we put it in our carry-on luggage. Um, this is Google Earth, so thank you, Google, for making this. It, this impresses people at every other talk I give, but I assume it would be like, <laughs> oh, that again here. Um, so uh, we go halfway around the world to Amman, Jordan, and uh, for the last three summers, we've set up pop-up mobile neuroscience labs, ran the first ever social neuroscience studies run uh, anywhere in the country or uh, the region, and um, what we were doing in this particular study that I'm going to tell you about is we, were, we found participants uh, over there who were either uh, pro-choice or pro-life with respect to abortion. Now, there is an important debate over there that's pro-life, pro-choice. It's not the same as our debate. Um, there's a general belief that abortion is wrong, uh, but there is a debate over whether or not there should be an exception in the case of rape. Okay, so that's what this particular debate is about. And there's lots of people on both sides. It's about a 50-50 split, which is what we were looking for. And then uh, we had videos made of um, local individuals uh, arguing basically for the pro-choice side or uh, the pro-life side. So we have videos, um, native language videos, where people are arguing for these two different sides. And both groups saw both videos while wearing um, FNIRs. So then I'll take you through kind of what we looked at and how this works. So both groups watch this pro-choice video. Okay. Uh, so let's say we pull out one of the people from the pro-choice side. Okay. So uh, conceptually, they're down here now. Pretend they're not up there anymore. Uh, and so what we can do is we can look at the extent to which this individual is showing um, a synchronous response with the average of all the pro-choice folks up there. Okay? Um, and you can do this iteratively. So then you pull out a different subject and put this one back, and you do it for everyone so that you see how each person is correlated with the rest of the group in the pro-choice group. And when you do this, what you see is that there's lots of synchrony. So red on the scale is you know, up at the high end, and then yellow is, is also pretty high as well. So we see lots of synchrony there, but when we do the same thing where we take someone who's pro-choice and see how their brain responses correlate with the folks who are pro-life, it's basically zero correlations uh, throughout the brain, uh, throughout the frontal cortex where we were looking. Okay, so they're seeing the exact same video, right? Like the same photons are hitting their eyes, the same sound waves are hitting their ears, but they experience it like them and not like them. And that's what's coming out here. And we can reverse it. Uh, so now you pull someone out from the pro-life group, um, and they'll show synchrony with the pro-life group, but not with the pro-choice group, just for complete sake. Um, and so once we started getting results like this, we started thinking that there were kind of a wide range of applications. And so um, one of the other people in my department sort of prodded me, and so we went and started a company so that we could do this in other places where we wouldn't ordinarily study this in, uh, inside sort of UCLA. And so the idea here is that as long as we have two different kinds of reference groups getting at a particular kind of way of experiencing a piece of the world, we can now basically figure out what a new case is actually seeing and experiencing when they're looking at something, because we can look at the extent to which they look like more of a match for one group or another. And this lets us basically, and broadly speaking, study the science of compatibility. And it's in a very sort of broad kind of definition. And so the idea here is if you experience something in similar ways as another person or group, um, then you'll show greater synchrony with that person or group under the proper stimulus conditions. So the pro-choice person watching a pro-choice video, not watching the Super Bowl, but watching the pro-choice video, then they're experiencing something in the same way or similar way to those folks. Um, and so then you can see that sort of thing. So imagine instead of looking at this, um, we were trying to figure out uh, who at a company is experiencing burnout right now, right? Some people in this room right now are feeling burned out working. It's just, it's a fact of the matter. There's a decent percentage of people that are feeling burned out and it's a big problem, right? I mean, people who are burned out leave, 
before they leave, their productivity goes way down, burnout is contagious. It's something that like anyone running a company or somewhere up in management really, really wants to avoid, but you can't go to your employees and say, tell me on a scale from one to 10, how burned out are you feeling? Um, because people are typically not going to tell you. That's not one of those things we reveal in interviews and, and performance reviews and things like that. But we could do the same kind of thing we did with the pro-choice, pro-life, okay? Uh, but now instead of looking at pro-choice, pro-life, we're looking at videos of uh, CEOs and executives talking about feeling really engaged or feeling burned out, okay? And then we have people that have already told us that they are feeling engaged or burned out, and we can see how they respond when they watch these videos and look at how that relates to individuals in this way. So to get at this, it's hard to get a bunch of executives and CEOs uh, in a room. They don't like to all show up at the same time. So we went to them um, a few months ago. We went to this event, Summit uh, LA. It's uh, an ideas fest for basically really wealthy CEOs and executives. Um, I could never afford to go to this event unless I was invited, which I was, thankfully. Uh, and so. Once we were there, people say yes to everything. And so we were super excited that a bunch of CEOs and executives were happy to come in and get their brains scanned together. Um, this is literally the first time four people have ever been scanned while having a conversation. Like that's never happened in any form. Um, so we thought that was pretty cool in and of itself. And they did interesting things while they were having conversations. I'm not gonna tell you about that data today. But another thing they did is at one point, there's a TV here, they all turned and looked at the TV and they watched videos uh, like these. So they saw some people talking about how engaged and excited they are at work, like this guy. What's really exciting to me personally is the, the ability to make an impact for millions, if not billions of people. You know, having a commercially successful product um, that is driven by technology, but ultimately making the human experience better. We get a lot of messages saying, Thank you, Ivy, which is our hotel concierge that we created. By texting you, I was able to get it in two minutes at my door, and it really, you, you're a lifesaver. Right, so you've got people like that, and then you've also gotten it, it to be fair, he talked about the, both the good and bad side, and this next guy talked about the good and bad side. So it's not like this next guy is like super burned out. We asked everyone to talk about both aspects of their job at different times. This is someone talking about feeling stressed out about being a CEO. Um, you know, it's a very stressful environment. It's sort of high risk, high reward. You've got a lot riding on pulling it off and that falls on the CEO and on management. And you've got, you know, your investors relying on you. You've got your employees who, um, uh, you know, that's their job and they're feeding their families and they're living. And so, you know, a lot of times it gets very close to the flame. It's so Okay, so imagine that you're either feeling super jazzed about the work you're doing, you're right where you should be, or you're feeling burned out. You're probably gonna experience these two kinds of videos differently based on what's going on with you in your life right now. And so that's what we wanted to look at. So um, basically everything I'm gonna show you is from this same medial prefrontal spot that I've shown you in, in some of the previous studies before. It seems to be associated with um, identity and sort of integrating things and um, identifying with something that you're taking in. And so what we see is that when people are watching the um, sort of what do you love about what you do types of videos, what we see is that the sort of engaged CEOs and executives, um, they show a fair amount of synchrony with one another in, in that condition. But the folks who are feeling burned out don't really show any synchrony when they're watching these uh, folks talk about how excited and engaged they are. When you see the folks talking about being stressed and burned out, now instead you see the burned out um, folks who are sort of stressed and, and feeling the pressure, these folks are showing more synchrony with one another um, than the executives uh, who are engaged and thriving and so on. So putting that together, uh, what you essentially see is that the engaged CEOs th show um, a lot more synchrony for the engaged videos and the folks who are feeling more burned out show more synchrony with the, the burnout videos, the stress videos, right? And we were actually using very simple sort of machine learning classification, able to classify about 85% of the folks uh, who were um, feeling burned out as being burned out based on their brain data. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's sort of a promising thing because, you know, doing this, you don't actually have to go ask folks. We knew because we were running that kind of study, but in the future, it could be used in an application where you don't know in advance um, who's feeling one way or the other. I'll just mention a couple of the other applications of this before I stop. Um, 
Dana Landis isn't here, right? Is that right? No, okay. So Dana Landis is at Google, but she's also um, on our advisory board. And so we've talked with her about sort of working towards um, solutions for the diversity pipeline. I know you guys have it in tech. We have it in academia. It's uh, a genuine real issue that's really, really hard to solve. And one of the things that we've sort of talked about is that you can go to folks who aren't necessarily, uh, you know, necessarily getting exposed to the best uh, training and they're not getting it in an environment, say in an inner school, um, uh, inner city school environment, elementary school, middle school, and so on, where not only are you not getting it, but there's not a lot of emphasis in the family or among friends to really cultivate an attitude towards what I should spend my time and energy on is learning how to do algebra or something like that. It's just not necessarily especially valued for understandable reasons in that context. But if you can go in and actually look at who shows brain responses when they look at certain mathematical or other types of STEM concepts that even look a bit more like folks who have excelled in that region, could you identify aptitude in folks who aren't going to show it on traditional tests? And there's some reasons to think that you actually can do this. And so this is something where if you could identify those folks when they're young, you could bring them over summers to sort of summer institutes where they get some of the kinds of exposure and uh, sort of norm setting that would lead people to get to a place like Google uh, where they probably wouldn't otherwise. And probably the idea that I'm most excited about is that if we can get data from the other work we're doing on what sort of thriving, engaged brains look like in a bunch of different careers, okay? Then you could develop what we call the neural guidance counselor, where you could take a 17-year-old who has no idea what to do with their life, and if you go to a regular guidance counselor, you're not gonna get any better idea of what to do with your life. I don't know that anyone's ever had a good experience with a guidance counselor. They're either neutral or creepy. Like, those are like the two options. Um, but what if you could basically go find out, okay, well, these are the things where you as a 17-year-old, you look at certain things in a way that's at least a bit similar to people in certain professions who are both productive, successful, and really happy doing that job. Um, there's lots of other things to think about in terms of uh, team construction. So we had these groups at Summit, and they were having conversations with each other, and there's lots of interesting dynamics. Like, we varied... Uh, the gender composition of the groups across the sessions. And we don't have that data analyzed yet, but we're really, really interested to see how synchrony profiles change when it's zero women, one women, two women, three women, so on. Right? That's going to be really interesting. Also, some of these people are the same people who told us they were feeling burned out. It turns out the people who are feeling burned out also reported being the least interested and engaged in what anyone else had to say when they were at these sessions. Right, so here's a way in which the sort of burnout feature is actually having a genuine impact on the way they interact with others. And when the folks who were feeling burned out was asked who was the most interesting, engaging person at the table, they were much more likely than anyone else to say me. Okay? Most other people pointed to someone else at the table, I mean, in writing, and said, oh, that person was really interesting. But the folks who were feeling burned out, they said, I guess I was the only interesting person at the table. Um, last thing is that um, there's the obvious, I think, application that this actually directly applies to regular old matchmaking. Um, and uh, we've thought about this a fair bit, but we think that this gets at a kind of compatibility where, you know, when you, uh, you know, use Tinder or whatever else, there's no measurement of compatibility on Match.com or eHarmony who even used to pretend that they did compatibility. It turns out it wasn't. There's interesting stories about that that I won't go into. Um, but you can actually measure compatibility in a, in a meaningful sort of way. You want to find people, like the person that you want to find and, and spend your life with is probably going to be someone that actually in meaningful ways sees the world similarly to the way you see it. Not visually, but conceptually. And this is a way to get at that. And there is data that suggests that this, in fact, can predict who will become friends. Uh, and there's no reason to think it couldn't predict uh, who would become friends that are more than friends if you take into account attraction and things like that. Um, so I think that's sort of a really interesting feature of this as well. So uh, I know that at this point um, I have gone long, and so I will stop there and uh, say thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks. So is there any sense of what types of companies 
increase social interactions? Like, what are the variables that are relevant? Like, one of the ones that we talked about often is the open workspace environment. There's like a big study that came out about it recently. Yeah. Are there other things like that that kind of are useful when it comes um, to increasing social, social interaction in a good way? Yeah, sure. So, um, I, and I've given talks for companies about sort of creating agile workspaces where you know nobody has their own desk or anything like that. It kind of seems like a disaster um, to do that for lots of reasons. I think anyone who works in one of those spaces knows you get a room full of people wearing headphones. Um, but people also feel a bit better if they have some space ownership. It turns out a lot of the motivation for making those kinds of spaces is that the company can lease a lot less space because when you're not there, somebody else can sit at the same desk, right? Um, now, there is evidence that suggests that um, putting people in proximity to each other is really important. So Human Eyes, who did the thing with the water cooler, 15 minute breaks and so on, one of the other studies they did is they looked at, I think this was with Deutsche Bank, um, or some bank, it may not be Deutsche Bank, I may just have that on the brain lately, um, but they had different banks where in some of the banks, everyone who worked in a certain division was on the same floor, and in some uh, companies, they were just on slightly different floors, like one floor apart with a stairwell internal to it, connecting them, and there were dramatic differences. They managed to convince them to switch one of these uh, to one of these, and the productivity went way up. And that seems to be due to the fact that now you've created a better case for social permeability so that people can connect more easily and so on. I think the other thing is, is that we tend to just not think about it very much. And so it's easy to do. I run a lab. It's easy for me to forget that, um, you know, in some sense, part of my job is uh, providing for and creating the right social atmosphere. We think, well, I provide my students with resources and I try to give them sort of good advice and wisdom and so on, um, but this is also where they're living part of their social life for several years. Right? I mean, we spend so many hours at work um, that that has to sort of have some of the same features that we look for outside of work. And I think that companies sort of think, well, I don't want to spend extra money on those things, but it turns out you're not because it reduces burnout. It reduces, so it's a good play for the company, but it's also really good for the people who work there. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Afnirs. Uh huh. Yeah. So I think uh, I, I'm just thinking whether it could be useful for personal emotional development, or I mean, how much does it cost, and it, have you thought about that? Sure. So um, there. I mean there. Okay, so there's a couple of answers to this. One is there's a lot of fly-by-night equipment out on the market right now, and the vast majority of it is junk. Um, so there's like a bunch of portable EEG things where you get a single lead that doesn't actually connect the right way to the scalp, like you're supposed to use certain kinds of leads that those don't because they're messy and expensive. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff out there that's junk that people are using that I'm sure there's some signal, but it's also signal swamped by noise. Um, FNIRS, like anything, has some signal, some noise. So, you know, but I think the signal, I've been convinced that the signal is meaningful um, at this point, although we're still sort of testing those things. In terms of using them for sort of personal use, um, I do think that that is a plausible, longer sort of time horizon scenario. Right now, uh, they are a bit clunky to set up. You need a technician there to set it up. I don't know that you could effectively set up your own right now. Um, but we are working with hardware companies about uh, engineering plans for how to make this more consumer friendly at some point down the road. So I think maybe in five years we might be looking at that. If you wanted to buy one for yourself, the sort of the lowest end one that I would think is really worth using is probably about a hundred grand. Um, there's toy ones that you can get for 50, but they are, I, I really do think they are toys and very, very limited in what they can do. A hundred grand would basically get you with pretty good signal, your prefrontal cortex, and then it doubles and triples and so on from there. And then in terms of the other part of the question, could you use it for post personal emotional development? It would take something really rigorous, I think, set up by some kind of company to make that work. I don't think you could just sort of sit there and stare at your signal and say, okay, I'm gonna work these parts of my brain and, and have that be terribly How meaningful. Yeah, so, so we actually uh, right now are starting a collaboration with a clinical psychologist at UCLA, Michelle Krask, where we're gonna have both the um, therapist and the client wear FNIRs during like, they do like 12 sessions. 12 weeks of sessions, and so they're gonna do it in week one, I think week 
3, 6, 9, and 12. Um, and so we're very interested in how the dynamics, both within the individuals and across the individuals, change over time, and how that predicts uh, sort of who feels like they've gotten the most out of it, and also who sticks with it, because most people actually drop out before they get to what therapists say should be the natural stopping point. Um, I also have a question about um, FNIRs. Um, so the first thing that popped in my head when you mentioned that it could be used to measure burnout when people don't actually you know, accurately report it is something like Black Mirror. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was just wondering, not to bias you, but I was wondering, um, what do you see as like a practically a way to get people to, um, to, to get their burnout measured or something similar like that? And what are the ethical implications of being able to do that? Right, um, so that's a good question. Uh, we, we get the burnout, uh, the, the Black Mirror comment very regularly. Um, we actually at some point thought about like naming the company something that would be an inside joke about Black Mirror, like something from one of the episodes, just to be like really like, yep, that, that's where you know, we live. Um, and I think you know, that really depends uh, on sort of how a company wants to sort of pitch what they're doing to their employees. So, you know, if finding out folks are burned out is then used in some threatening way, then, you know, that's not really good for anyone. But if it's used in a way to sort of direct more resources and to sort of help folks who are vulnerable for leaving the company or who might benefit from certain types of interventions, um, then that's something that I think is probably more positive. But I totally agree that there's some uses of what we're doing, like the neural guidance counselor thing, um, that's a pure benefit for anyone who goes and does it. Like if you're 17 and you go and do this, you get told like you're a 90% match with this and a 30% match with that and do without what you want, but you might not have known these things. A lot of us grow up thinking, well, I should do what my parents did or something like that. Or we get into a random internship after college and suddenly that's our career 20 years later. Um, this is a way to sort of try out things that you could never go try out on your own. So I think that there's sort of a range of different applications and some of them, um, I think that folks who want to use this will have to think about, well, what are the benefits that a person gets? And there are lots of potential benefits. So you could get information yourself that relates not necessarily just to burnout. If you're feeling burned out, you probably know that. But there's a lot of other things about the extent to which you cert show certain kinds of skills and aptitudes and so on. Uh, people love things like the Myers-Briggs, even though it's complete junk, right? It doesn't actually tell you anything meaningfully. Any, you know, psychometrician will say, don't ever, ever use that. Um, but people are really, really interested because they want to sort of get this kind of standardized feedback. And I think that is one of the things that this could be used to do. We haven't done that specifically, but I think it could be used in, in some of those domains. And it could be used... Um, to see if you sort of qualify to get certain kinds of trainings or promotions or whatever. So you could have your brain scan. So imagine the neural guidance counselor and it says, you're a great match for this, but you don't test well and things like that, right? This could become in part a partial substitute where you say, well, I don't test well, but I'll probably do the actual thing well because my brain looks like the people who do the actual thing well. That's an interesting possibility. And on behalf of Google, I would like to thank Matt. I would also like to say UCLA is very lucky to have you, and we are very lucky <laughs> to have you for this hour. Thank you, Luke. Thank you so much. All Thanks, right. everyone.